Enjoy a seat at the table for great conversation and good company. Welcome to And Good Company. I'm Sarah Fiedelholtz. We all know a great dinner party isn't really about the food. It's about the people seated around the table engaging in lively discussion. And Good Company gives you a seat at the table to enjoy smart and interesting conversations as they happen. I am pleased to be in the company again of Julia Meek, who is the WBOI arts and culture reporter. She's the host and producer of Folk Tales and a living legend artist of, the, for, of Fort Wayne. So welcome. That was quite a welcome. Thank you so much. It's always fun to sit at your table, Sarah. Well, thank you. And so the reason that um, I'm asking you to sit here today and have this conversation with me, unlike most shows, which really, they really, I don't know where they're going to go in the direction, is because um, I've been working on this project about happiness and how people define happiness. And you were gracious enough to participate in the actual exhibit that I'm doing with the Jeffrey Kroll Gallery here at the library. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about happiness and also the role of music and songs in terms of not only how music inspires musicians in terms of happiness, using happiness as a muse, but also the role that music plays in people's lives to make them happy. So the first thing I wanted to sort of start with is looking at the idea. I mean, obviously, you know, you, from your creation of folk tales and using um, that it's a unique form of storytelling. And, you know, you've created weekly programs with, you know, a variety of themes, everything from sunshine and blue skies, joy, education, shame. I mean, you name it, you've covered it. So I'm curious when you think about happiness um, as a theme in music from around the globe, what are your thoughts about it and how is it used in, as a muse? Music does make the world go round. Uh, we certainly know that. And yes, thank you for your interest in folk tales. And certainly with folk tales, the whole premise of folk tales is that through music we can best understand and respect the peoples of the world. We can best understand ourselves as well through our music, through other people's music, just through the language of music. So one answer, I'll try not to ramble um, throughout this conversation, but one answer to your question, it's all about the music. And, the, and music is a language and um, we might say many wonderful things about happiness as muse, music as muse, connecting everything all together. And of course it's true, it's probably been said before by someone way more eloquent than I am. The thing remains, music's the best way to understand everything. I also like the quote, and use this one a lot, the greater part of our happiness or misery depends on our dispositions and not on our circumstances. Now, Martha Washington was attributed with that quote, uh, but it's got to be ancient. It was written somewhere without words on a cave uh, painting wall somehow, mm -hmm. you know, to convey that message because we have to keep happy to have hope. It's a great component of hope and we have to have it to, to go mm -hmm. forward. That's been so since ancient times. And if you think about that, um, the first way that people would express their emotions, be it happiness or sorrow, is um, the voice and maybe, you know, and with song. The voice is accredited with being the first instrument of course and, and 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 the current you know speaking of relevancy and um, here to stay we hope also as well and certainly giving voice to that all beyond the pleasure the search and, and pursuit of pleasure is 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 survival and so linking it with that having again the hope like H, they're, they're, they're fairly close in the dictionary and that's with a good reason too of course because at least psychologically, in the Julian area, I'll say. But um, yes, it's, it, it all goes together with being able to pick up and carry on and to remember what you need. Music is a tool for, for learning and remembering, of course, as well. 
everything, where there's danger, what you did when there was sadness, but certainly the pursuit of happiness. And so you also talk about that um, music, you said, I'm quoting you, is the thing. It's our walking pace. It's what is, it's what it's based on. It all goes back to that, you know, the human voice. And, and it's also what you need for community um, is mm -hmm. music. And one of the things that, so in the other 17 individuals that I um, interviewed about how they define happiness, music, as well as sig certain songs, were very instrumental um, to their their defining happiness. Several, it was playing, having a either a happy playlist or mm -hmm. playing certain songs when they're in the car with the windows down and driving. And and so, why is it? Do you think that songs um, and specific songs are so important, or we link them to either our current or past happiness? What is it about songs themselves? Thank you for bringing up the thread of the walking pace, because yes, that is how that's that's the first um, feeling and connection. If you, the further back we go in time, and to the hunter gatherer, you know, the, the the moving and connecting and and quite communal white lifestyle, that's um, one learns to feel that prenatal, neonatal, in the backpack as you're walking down the road of life. Truly, your walking pace is your music pace, and it's your heartbeat. It's the external heartbeat, if you will, of, um, of carrying it along. It, 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 it is in you. It's all around you. We relate. That's why it's easier, even with music, than art. You don't even have to use your eyes. You hear, and you are into the quite literally the pace and the and the and the heartbeat of of, of your community through your music yes the if it's expressing a set we have a, the whole range of emotions are there and necessary being happy all the time there's oh, that would be another folk tale but being happy all the time doesn't you know kind of puts the takes the big thrill out of being happy right. <laughs> we need the textures we need the paces we need everything you know to 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 carry us through life and and reflect on what is happening with us but um the fact that we can Carry it in our DNA. It's beyond, you know. Once it's 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 not only just a, this thing that's in us vaguely somehow. It, we are we are hardwired by now to respond to the sounds that that make our world, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and you also said so. You actually said that part of your definition is this um, this having the spiritual balance to keep your heartstrings vibrating at the right frequency. So mm -hmm. is that what you mean by that um, that pace or? that internal kind of music in a sense? Is that what that means to you? I would say that it all melds uh, or and builds on each other and um, is wired so that without our thinking about it, it, whether it's a cell phone or a computer or uh, an electric instrument or, or my heart strings right now. Yes, they are. They are vibrating at frequencies. The world is electromagnetic. We know all of the physics and 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 chemistry and um, things that are way. Beyond. I do not do the folk tale of chemistry or physics or you know any of the. Well, well, that's not even true because I've had the folk tale of of the four elements would hit right. some of that. But yeah, right. again, everything in this conversation is certainly. Um, bound to show the connection and the connectivity between everything, especially the arts in our environment and especially music within the arts, yes. Yeah, and I mean the idea that you also say is that if you look at it from a global perspective, it doesn't matter if you don't understand the, the lyrics, like if it's in a different language or something, but that it really is this universal language and there is a commonality in mm -hmm. song that people can um, respond to. That's something by going on a topic around the whole musical globe uh, that we prove week, week in and week out. It's not um, contrived or forced in any way because the music that represents a certain um, feeling or emotion or characteristic or whatever will affect the same parts of the of the brain and the same chemistry within within 
a hundred different mm -hmm. people, that, that commonality will mm -hmm. be there. Same of all of the arts, but I do think that music, because it comes totally from that walking pace and the beat and resonates in our heartstrings, is, is immediate and, again, easiest to be taken universally. And I think also the idea that um, songs make us feel something. I mm -hmm. mean, if you think about... Which was their point, correct. Right, which is the nature, really, of country music or folk music. And, um, but when you originally were thinking about folk tales, which was really using music for storytelling, you know, it would have been easy for you to do just country music or folk music, but you felt that um, that, that wasn't really what your intent was. So talk about the intent of folk tales in terms of how to use music to show um, and demonstrate different emotions like happiness. Well, first of all, in figuring out the perfect combination for a folk tale, I knew that I didn't want to be bored and I didn't want to bore my listeners. And to me, and any one country, and don't ever make me try to say what country I love the most or would prefer if I could only have one, one country's music because I would hate to have to choose, but just so. I would think it would be very boring week in, week out to only work within a certain frame bound by geography even socioeconomics, even any one thing, but especially geography, because our world, our brain, our thoughts, our feelings, our own melting pot is so much bigger than that. So with that in mind, it's just natural to try to paint, to make a texture. I will also always be the first to tell you that doing a folktale is just like painting the most wonderful picture that you can dream up, but you paint it in, in um, music not in, in brush stroke or whatever your medium might mm -hmm. be. And so that, that is another reason that I prefer the, the comparative, the big, the, the collage, the big sweeping panoramic view of whatever we are discussing that is a common thread. That's another point of folk tales as we discuss the um, universal uh, uh, similarities and connections and tell those stories. And what do you, um why do you think that music is the most powerful means of expression? Because it can resonate, probably in in, in you know in the in in the in the laws of physics. I, I do expect that that goes far. And what do you think um, is this idea? You use this phrase, musical wisdom. What do you mean by that? That it, is it that music can, you know, sort of help teach us or? you know, get, um, guide us along the way or what we take from sure, song? Sure, if you take it, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's contemporary, it's an ageless, timeless thing, but much like those cave paintings, that's all they had. And it got us here today. I, I don't know, I, I, I don't know, our cell, our cell phones would if we, if we, if, if we had the electricity. If we had the grid, We've kept them on the grid. I mean, of course, back for the, the so the primitive grid there was the 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 way, mm -hmm. the path, your pace, your walking pace, resonating inside you, and the next direction that you get on a cave painting around that bend, and that's that's pretty powerful. Now, the other component in that journey <laughs> is is music. And the, and the one instrument that could be taken anywhere along with you is the voice. And so put it all together and, the, and it's those remembered, it's those memories. Memories serve so many purposes, starting with, starting with survival and ending with the pursuit of, in this conversation, happiness. Right. And it also, a lot of times, um, that those memories and the recollections of past times when you were happy or you remember certain things, were when you play certain songs, or certain songs make you think or bring you back to that time. So it, it allows you to the, it allows you mm -hmm. to create that um, mm -hmm. happy experience for yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you say that that's true about it? It's 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 vital to it. Again, it survival and surviving well then as now relies a lot on how well you remember and act on what you remember. 
And the best way to do that is to have a really full graphic, um, the most effective network of, of um, prompts that you possibly can. So yes, that certainly plays into mm -hmm. it. And then taking a pass of that when you don't need it for survival, it, all of those things from ancient times till now weren't just pulled out when it was, oh, time to look at, see what we need to do next. It was for every bit of enjoying the present, remembering the past, all of the things that are human nature that make people uh, people, that make us uh, a, a, a community and a, and a universal collective, I think. And so when I looked at, um, I was looking at some of the um, songs, the most, the top 20 happy songs of all times. So um, there's obviously uh, Don't Worry, Be Happy by Bobby McFerrin, which actually um, he said that the lyrics were inspired by a phrase popularized by an Indian mystic. And then there's Happy Together by the Turtles, and You Made Me So Very Happy by Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and even more recent Happy by Ashanti, and My Ending, My Happy Ending by Avril Lavigne. But a lot of the, the happy titles were also songs from the 50s and 60s. And I'm wondering, um, from your perspective, was that more of a, because you wouldn't necessarily think that part of the 60s was such a cheery, cheerful time, you know, but why do you think that so many songs that were um, produced and created in the 50s and 60s use the theme of happy and being happy? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> and as we look again through the pages of the Julian Airy, I think that um, such a very important part of our whole collection of preserving the folk music and the folk customs actually were being harvested, came to fruition, being harvested by the 60s, and that's because of recording equipment and the ease and accessibility. I'm one of my particular musical heroes is R. Uh, Murray Schaefer, who's quite a composer and musician and musicologist from Canada, and he attributes uh, the he attributes amplification to being the biggest connection and modern connection, and it happened early in the 20th century when people could finally amplify, record, share music. Since ancient times, and again, there's so many quotes, there's so many themes, there's so many stories, uh, there's so many true cases. The uh, song catcher is a wonderful, uh, barely fictitious movie set in, in, in transitional times in the South that was uh, talking about women coming into power within university settings, all following one woman who wanted to go down and record the true music uh, the, in, 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 up in the, in the mountains, you know, mm -hmm. and that was quite a story. But as soon as somebody could get out their child, the child ballads, before recording, he had, he could scribe it. He wrote those down. He understood the importance of connecting and, and, and getting it before it was lost. There's the other key word before or three. It was lost. That's the important thing. By the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, recorded, recording, portable recording equipment, the Lomax brothers, I've, we've spoken before off, off uh, camera about this, but they, believe so much in finding music around the world to substantiate or to go take the next step after Child and his ballads. So they couldn't wait. They they took the then portable recording equipment of the day, which was probably tw maybe twice around as this table, and they were out getting, uh, somebody got Woody Guthrie before he passed. You know, things like that became so instrumental. Inst interestingly enough, when, um, the Lomaxes were in Appalachia looking for Jane Ritchie, who they had heard about and needed to find her for the Appalachian traditions. She was over in um, England and, and uh, Scotland recording her roots with the same portable recording systems. And I mention and stress all that because as we sit here with our little things and our, and our lists and our, mm -hmm. and, and I hope we're all happy because <laughs> we're still trying to be so. It's, 
that drive that started back then and as all sorts of amplification and radio and television and technology was happening and we could go out there and get that music, it was totally necessary we do so because it was drying up, it was disappearing because of radio and television making people consumers and not producers of music, of their own music. And do you think that also that because maybe to counteract what was happening in the 60s or maybe to support what was happening in the 60s that this theme of happiness and happy became such a, a push in, in the type of songs and, and um, music that was recorded? What was important in the 60s is that one was encouraged, uh, almost even charged with or challenged with expressing oneself. That's the difference. It, to me, in, in my opinion, it has more to do with the whole transitional times and the early 20th century of, of Europe, and that's where a lot of our ethnomusicology comes directly from, and I'm not among the rest of the world, and we see this all reflected in the rest of the world, but as it came to us, there was a lot of transitional stuff. There were world wars and huge depressions to prove it. Things were changing, things were crumbling. It was still very much um, coming out of the Victorian uh, eras where you didn't say what you thought. You did, did, you know, so many things. I think that the 60s was the, was the decade where everybody was supposed to, exp was, was again, encouraged so much to express oneself. We had all of this technology bringing all these traditions. We had our own folk singing movement that was actually in the 50s, and that would be more of a reflection or a, uh, yeah, uh, an answer or a response to the things that did happen through the, the whole century and then causing and after World War II into the 50s, which was still the military time, also wondering, to do, wondering what to do with all of this technology. People heard more folk music from every country in the world between 1952 and 62, just because television at that time was so commercial and accessible was so hungry for anything and everything to put on the stage, and one of the most popular things to put on the stage is homemade music. So yeah, it just, it's a wonderful cycle that we're, that, that, that I love uh, having job security and producing it, arts and culture uh, interviews perhaps, and certainly things like folk tales because it's there for the sharing. And so, so you think that really the 60s was really a time when music became more of use for expression of how you were feeling or what you were seeing or only after the 60s was certainly recognized as a time where it's cool to have those expressions and share them with people whether you're a child a woman uh, red black yellow green or blue you know it was the t eastern western the importance was you are you you should be happy you should share it. Right. And also the idea, I mean, you know, people don't, young people today don't realize, but like when people would get an album and they would lie on the floor and listen to it and look at the album and read the lyrics and sort of be transported or even, you know, sort of be in a meditative state um, mm -hmm. that could bring them um, either past memories or to think about the future or, and so that really helped to push the idea of being happy or thinking about happiness or what you would what would make you happy I mean so it also allowed afforded that opportunity indeed again it was the time it was the technology it was a natural evolution also remember at that time people like Vance Packard were I believe I think it was in the 60s early 60s that's where hidden that's when and what Hidden Persuaders was all about because it was about the marketing mystique that obviously glommed onto the fact that there is that pursuit of happiness. And, and uh, by the way, another component that actually happened in the 50s and then, and then is here making this all ferment and such is the increase of free time. And again, that's a lot of technology and a lot and the rest of our lifestyle, again, f feeding into the, um, the, the happiness and the keeping up with the Joneses kind of happiness that Vance Packard was looking for and that push some say and still say was quite specific and intentional by 
manufacturers everywhere to get people to buy their happiness. And so who are you going to believe? Right. Well, and you, I mean, so now, I mean, so, I mean, other people were trying to help you either through music or other, you know, philosophers or even marketers were trying to help you other, you know, people to define happiness or create, find their happiness. And so, or buy it in, or a, buy in it, a can, right, yeah. right, or in a can or in a jar or in a cream or, you know, anything or in a car <laughs> or even in a house. So what, um, let's talk about how you define happiness. Starting with it being so personal, I'm not going to say it's elusive, of course, but I do believe it's the ability to balance all that you have in your life, all that you have in your soul, and to come out with a positive, with a, with a positive reflection. I um, have another odd little situation. I love my life and everything that I do. I don't have time to watch a lot of television. It's not, um, it, I, I enjoy the medium and what can be done with, with, with that large or small screen to be sure. My chance to come across a performance, a little performer that was on The Voice some years ago, just was a, just a little snippet going from A to B real late one night and, um, and, and found a little video and it was a, a little beautiful young woman. It, it was, it came out in her little pre-performance speech that she had been suffering for the last few years of cancer. So she was pretty hard off. She had a beautiful singing voice. She was on an emerging beautiful little career. She went by Nightbird Jane and she did go on to sing her piece, but the quote was that she shared with us was, you can't wait until life isn't hard anymore before you decide to be happy. I thought, well, leave it to a, a, a brilliant and beautiful person firsthand to be able to even form that and share it and say that she is a night bird indeed, but, but how true that is. And that speaks not just as a, I mean, it's a very positive thing, and we all wish and hope that we can do that. Maybe if we've even been successful once, we could do it again. But also, that's vital to that balance. That's the only way to, to be happy, I think, and that's so important, too. It, it's, 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 I, wa I want to be happy because I want to survive. It could be as simple as that. But I don't think it's as simple as that for you. I mean, that you want it. It is or it isn't, but yes. Yeah, yes. I, mean, I mean, you also, um, when I interviewed you for the exhibit, one of the things that you um, may or may not realize that um, you talked a lot about and associated with your happiness was this idea of security and safety. And I'm wondering, because you talked about it with, um, you, even with um, things, like you wanted to have just enough you know, to satisfy your uh, needs and things, but not too much. You talked about that even when you were teaching and you realized some of the insecurity that um, the students had with food and clothing and, and shelter. And then you also talked about the security that you got from your grandmother um, about not being afraid of anything. Mm -hmm. So talk about, um, and what I'm trying to also show is that how your experiences through your life and those who you know helped you through your you know childhood years how they sort of help you create and create your own i guess definition of happiness but talk about this whole idea of security and all of these ways that how that influences your happiness again and i am speaking for myself but if we go back to the most ancient of times especially before the agrarian lifestyle kicked in and there was that sort of comfort or a new way to define being comfortable because you could stay in one place. I, it's, it, it still goes back to the fact that there has to be some connection between the hope that you need to go forward and the, your own self-preparedness to allow you to, to get there and to continue to go forward that makes you, that motivates you, that makes you want to be, that t makes you know in yourself, and that's self-confidence, yes, of course, and it's also security, 
to know that you don't have to worry about everything. Don't worry, be happy. You don't have to worry. You can be happy. And a lot of that is the, some, I'll, I'll bring up the grasshopper and the ant or the little red hen, and then we don't need to bring up any more of those. But there are always guidelines to help you do what you need to do and, and get where you need to be so that you can have that feeling because you need that feeling to be able to concentrate and focus on the rest of your life. That in itself will make you happy, <laughs> and it's all about being happy. Again, I hate to speak in so many oversimplifications, but I feel that that I feel that that is so. It does help, even though one may not have a lot of resources, if one is resourceful, and that's where being able to express oneself. That's why I say it's. I've always felt it easier for me to be happy. And those people in my life that mentored and helped me form those things at a very, very early age were of the same mind. I don't know how I would be if I was raised by other people, but I, but I truly believe that if you can do for yourself, for survival, that's an empowerment. If you can create, and I do think I'm so fortunate and blessed to be able to create, it doesn't matter how well uh, but I can share a thought, I can convey a thought, I can put a thought down on, on any, any uh, surface with almost any medium. I never met a medium I didn't like, and that does uh, certainly carry to music. And then with, if you speak of communal aspects of both, well, communal art is just something so powerful as, again, you know, making music by oneself is too, but making it with a group or sharing something that everybody knows, it's just, an, it, it, just it, it, it exponentially is, it is just concentric circles getting bigger and bigger and bigger, not dissipating because it matches, it hits yours. And then together they make one great big power. And that's where, where mine, I want mine to be as strong as it can be. And it is made stronger by the creativity and the preparedness, those two things, and then it's going to get me closer to yours and what's going on in your world. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And do you think that because um, creating and being creative is so important to you, do you think that we create our own happiness? By Martha Washington's description, yes, certainly I do. I mean, what? yes, yes. Create... Um, in the selection process, I'll say yes. And um, I mean, you always say that you uh, you think I mean that you can always find something to be happy about. I mean, do you think? I that hope so. I mean, yeah. So, knock on wood, so far. <laughs> so, do you think that's something that um, was just natural to you? Do you think that's something you intentionally create for yourself? Do you think that's something that maybe that your grandmother gave you? I think I'm fortunate that I was surrounded by by parents and grandparents, again, very creative, very resourceful. I wish it could have been way easier for them because my own mom had a hard path to go. We lost our dad when we were very, very young. Uh, my d Plenty of circumstances that everybody has in their life. And I remember I, being, I think I'm blessed at a young age to just, I was sat back and and listened and watched, you know, and you do hear the music and you do see the, those paintings along the, still, no matter how figurative they all may be by now about what you, what you could or should be doing, what you can and, 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 and hopefully will be creating to form your own security and to make your own world and to help other people because that to me is a big part of it too. I am not, I would hate to be, I mean, I, th I, I like to be self-sufficient and I hope that I am, but I also, <laughs> cannot imagine being in a, in a cloister situation for very long unless I had to if that was my I would I would draw uh, plenty I think but and and hum in my head but uh, but seriously I think I'm very fortunate to have had so many influential people again not always the average circumstances especially for the growing up in those 50s and um, to this day I am so happy to have always stayed outside all of the obvious or 
still, even in the 21st century, these constricting or confining boxes that people might want to be in or put other people in. You know, I, I, I'm happy to go about my way, and that's how I do it. But you also talk about that you're, you're not a materialistic person yet, um, and the community is what gives you your riches. It is, that's, it is, that is my wealth, and I am proud of that to be sure, I mean, to have so much. One thing I think that you cannot have enough of perhaps is community connections, you know? And I, um, we won't get into whether they can be bought or, or you know, advanced Packardism there, I'll make right. a reference to him, but otherwise, no, that, that is the importance and, and, and to me, my solid gold, yes. And I, I, there's no secret recipe for building that kind of a, or, or even wanting or, or making it satisfying for you, but I do think that I'm very fortunate to have always um, had the resources to be able to share, to share with, with the community, mm -hmm. yes. And, and clearly when you think about your own creativity um, with the arts, um, helps you to express and be happy, but what, what role do um, arts like music or listening to music or s going to see an exhibit or you know photography or a musical what what role does those play in terms of your own um, definition of happiness beyond just you being a creator in the arts do you mean well i mean we agree and, and, and of course totally and, and genuinely accept the fact of how powerful those things are in affecting us. Right. I want to know how they in really affect you personally. Like when you listen to a great piece of music or you see an incredible painting or you know, you watch an incredible dance performance. Oh, it's, I mean, of course it's thrilling. Of course, it, I mean, it's total, to me, it's a totally immersive as well as, uh, uh, I'm not gonna say that it's, it's I'm possessed, but it, it, it is, a, it's putting on a, it, yes, it's being saturated, perhaps might be a word if you're, and I may be easily, saturated or attracted but yes I, I and I like letting those floodgates or the barrier whatever you want I don't I don't feel about like barriers up and down I guess is my eyes are, and ears are genuine genuinely and almost always open I hope to be I guess that I, I think that working hard to keep not only an objectivity about oneself just as a general because approach any day, there's enough to do without fighting your own <laughs> subjectivity. So it's like, just get neutralist. Yeah, neutrality is a, a nice p thing to put mm -hmm. on in the morning and have with your morning cup of joe or whatever you have and then go out and face the day. Yes, and if you do that, everything that's out there is going to present itself to you. Now again, this sounds, yes, ridiculously simple. The stuff that, that, that the fables and the wisdom tales and the kata and, the Bible, every good book, east, west, north, and south, spirit, will tell you. So I, I'm not saying anything new. I do think the key is be ready for it, be watching for it, and have something that you know you're going to do with it when it comes. So do you think of yourself as someone who is um, easily made happy? Yes. You know? <laughs> Yes, even my my friends and my enemies will will, and everybody in the vast middle will will tell you I'm pathetically optimistic at times. Also, maybe even in the same paragraph or at the start of the next one, they'll tell you I'm brutally and blatantly honest. Um, that's part of objectivity too. And I think that you know, do I like every piece of music? I think do I only listen to pieces of music I like and think of little candies and. No, I mean, I, and I love Mr. Rogers, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not Mrs. Rogers, or even in the Rogers family. I mean, I would love to be thought of as <laughs> some <laughs> shirt tail relatives or a great big fan of the Rogers family, but seriously, I just think that if you keep that attitude, I, 
we can only help people help themselves. We cannot help, we cannot do stuff for people either. So I cannot tell you anything magic except open your heart and soul to it, you know, and, and eyes and ears and brain and everything to whatever it is from from survival to happiness to to dealing with sadness to dealing with all the other things sad again you don't want you can't wait till things aren't hard you can't wait till everything's perfect you can't wait till there's nothing making you sad in order to be happy right well that's, that's what that, your whole right point of this is all about right. well it's the whole idea that people say oh i'll be happy when i lose 10 pounds i get that job i uh, get that raise i buy that new car and the state is that they may be happy for a moment, or it may, but not. It's kind of like the folk tale of shoulda, woulda, coulda. <laughs> but yeah, just so. Especially if it is the more physical something is, or material, um, because certainly a roof over one's head is very, very physical, but it's, and, and necessary. I mean, food, clothing, and shelter being essential, but yes, the, in, the inner peace and calm that doesn't come from stuff it, it, and it comes from your own heart and your own heart strings yes so and do you think that your definition both uh, in, for looking at other people but really for yourself do you think it changes as you get older or you move through different stages of life as we've just been talking mine's pretty basic and pretty uh Primitive as in, you know, meaning primal, if you will. So I more work toward nurturing it or, 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 or living up to it or pro keep, keeping it healthy and, and well fortified to not diminish it. I'm always open to new things and twists and 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 um, ways to do anything better, and that would be including to keep a good attitude, especially as we do get to this end of of our life's food chain, you know. But um, and and I'm always happy to learn n new things. That's part of I think what keeps me happy. I don't suggest anybody do what somebody else is doing to make them happy. I do suggest one try as hard or as extensively to get in a happy place to figure out something that really works. Right. Well, I mean, part of the problem is, is if they're constantly looking at how what someone else does to be happy or mm -hmm. what someone else has to be happy mm -hmm. or if they keep looking at all of those things or measurements then that precludes that they will be happy because all they're doing there is comparing themselves to others or seeing where they're short-sighted or um, you know again Vance Packard checked in in the middle of the last century on that very very problem and situation and it's not becoming any easier uh, everything you know for every action there's an equal an opposite reaction for everything that's your best friend. There's going to be something that they have that that's going to make it's like your worst. Enemy. All of those things, exactly what you're saying. It's you. You're, you can easily set yourself up to 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 fail or, or or to be very miserable by your own efforts to be happy. It's yes. like that yin and that yang yep. of it. It's it's balance. And and then speaking of karma, and that is another folk tale, <laughs> which we've had, had a lot of fun doing, as a matter of fact. But yeah, it's uh, it, it it's all woven together, a true tapestry. Beyond it, I can't think of anything. Perhaps uh, often they'll talk about often. Um, uh, a hummingbird's wing, or you know, such a del such a true delicacy, or a butterfly, or a whole kaleidoscope of butterflies, and the little the combination of, of uh, of textures and little and, and tiny little secrets they hold. You know, that's 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 the complexity mm -hmm. that we're talking about mm -hmm. here. Do you think that people focus too much on being happy and their happiness? Again, referring to Vance Packard, it all depends <laughs> on what, what, you, what you think you can buy to get it. But um, I, I will counter by saying this isn't for everyone. But I think 
that it's, I think one, I think self-absorption, I fear that self-absorption has been another thing that has been happening, that self indulgence you know, especially, it, you deserve it. And we, we all deserve happiness, by the way, but what you deserve to get there, it can be a terrible trap to, in the end, make you feel that whatever it is you think you want or don't even know what you want, you don't have or you ain't going to get. So that's like a counterproductive um, a prompt right there. And I think that far too often, especially in this 21st century now, that's certainly like this, and, I, and again, going back to social media, kind of pushing, think of, you know, it's all about you, it's all about you. Well, in, in my mind, it's all about the whole world, and so I can't force other people to be, to, to have that perspective, but I think that it's way harder to be happy if you don't have that kind of a perspective. I would counter with, what have you done for somebody else in the last 24 hours. I am certainly a huge, huge advocate, a fierce warrior uh, for volunteerism. And that's something I've worked hard on all my life because all of the precious, they say some of the best things in life are free, <laughs> but <laughs> for all else, you need a, an army to help you do it and, and volunteers can make the difference there. And to me, that has been a great source of my happiness and also my achievements and also the things that I've been able to do for other people to make them happy. And so I cannot say enough about um, the, the properties of thinking outside of yourself and for the good of man, the, the, the world that we live in, which is another point of the, of the primitive survival, including the arts that are there to help you remember it. So you keep just making me tie everything back and bring it all the way back here, and I'm happy to do that. Well, that's, I think, part <laughs> of um, your wisdom that you bring. <laughs> Thank you. And through um, lots of the ups and downs of life that you have. I mean, you know, when you think about some of the struggles, I mean, you have a, a, a younger sister with um, special needs, and you had a stroke um, four years ago, or is it coming up? Yeah. It's well back, yeah. And you know, and you think about the challenges and the ever-changing landscape of media and what that means for public radio and every other challenge that you face and you know, you lost the love of your life. And how does that all sort of bring, you know, sort of where, how do you internalize that and then create the wisdom to, take all what the, those kinds of things and, and bring it to um, how to continue to move ahead. And in, in my own world and prescription for that kind of survival, you know quite well it's through the arts and, and, and through storytelling and through sharing. And if we take uh, uh, Nightbird Jane's words, you can't wait till everything's good, you know. That, that's just it. You, <laughs> and that sounds crazy simple, but to me, the alternative is absolutely unthinkable. To me, that would be, that would be the 1984 rat cage on the face of, of, if I couldn't do something to satisfy and hopefully increase my own happiness, which is connected to my world and your world. And you know, it, that, that's, that's, that's my, that's my theory, and I am sticking to it because that's it's because it means so much. Mm -hmm. Do you think that when you were younger or when you made decisions in your life, do you think you were ever driven by the question of, will this make me happy, or I want to do this because of the personal reward and you know uh, happiness that I'm going to get from it, or did you just believe that there were certain things that just innately um, you went towards or just had to express, and through that you found your happiness? If I understand your question, and I think I do, like which came first. Well, it, I'm trying it, to say is, do you do things, do you chase the happiness, or do you just chase whatever you express, doing things that you innately just want, you know, have to do in a sense, and then that brings the happiness? I think in my life, it, truly, it has been, you do what you're doing, and I was encouraged, even though life wasn't always easy when we were kids, often it wasn't, but we were always encouraged to pursue 
that which we thought was important. And, and, so, and we were surrounded with, by people that, that, that really, really supported us in that. So yes, it was just the doing. I, 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 I feel like I'm blessed by having been and still being quite inquisitive. Might drive other people crazy, but, and, I, and I always try to be respectful with it, but yes, at such an early age, and it wasn't about the stuff. And I, thinking back, the, the, the things I had did make me happy, but it was always, I always had things that would be, help me make other, make things. And that really made me happy, yes. So it was, all, it was always thinking, wow, this makes, this is happiness. Wow, yeah, I get exactly what it feels. It feels so good. And so, yes, it, it isn't like, I wanna do this so I can feel good. I, I, however anybody's motivated, I, I, can't, um, I can't speak to, except to put a folktale together about how it worked for them or didn't work, you know? But that's, that's the point of sharing the memories that's so important of telling the good story. And, and we were raised on stories as, that's not unusual. I think it's been elusive, and I think storytelling was sort of, again, much like homemade music and storytelling, all of that was endangered by the um, social media of the day, ex especially television and um, uh, audio, radio of mm -hmm. any sort, and film and everything else, but especially radio, and of that of which R. Murray Schaefer, <laughs> that of which R. Murray Schaefer spoke back then because amplification, that was the time when you could do something bigger than you. To, to, mural is bigger than life. Is a mural a rush to do? Oh my goodness, yes. Is a mural a rush? I'll ask you. Is it a rush to look at when you see one? Is it a rush to, when you see the whole, when you, when you hear the sound of a, of a, of a cyclone or a, a wind, you know, a wind, the biggest sound in the world or, or a choir or you name it, you know, that is such a rush and that's that it has served its purpose and that's, that's the, the forces and factors that we're talking about here. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and if they all happen in your own head and your own heartstrings, it's still a very, very, very big um, response. And that's what you're looking to achieve. That's what, yeah, well, yeah. Or it's just what happens. That's what I enjoy happen, having happened, yeah. So at the end of each Anne Good Company program, I ask guests the same 12 questions that French novelist Marcel Proust popularized from the Victorian game. But because you've already answered the original 12, I have 12 more for you. So apropos to our conversation, what is your idea of perfect happiness? Balance. What is your greatest fear? Mean spirit. What is the trait you most deplore in yourself? Now there are plenty. I'm not looking for one. <laughs> um, internalizing too much. Which living person do you most admire? This is the toughest question I think you've ever, ever asked me. I simply can't. I simply can't single out a living person. There are many, starting with yourself oh and going through all of our community, all the way. What is your greatest extravagance? It would be travel if I had more time. What is your current state of mind? Happy. On what occasion do you lie? Surprise birthday parties. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a terrible liar. Which words or phrases do you most overuse? <laughs> Peace. What talent would you most like to have? Even more communication. What is your most treasured possession? My friends. What do you most value in your friends? Mm. 
their goodness. What is your greatest regret? All the things that I didn't get to do to help somebody. If you were to die and come back as a person or a thing, who or what would it be? Something bright and beautiful and probably blue. That's all I can narrow it down. Well, you did some good narrowing down there. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Julia Meek, who for the past 35 years has given so much more to the community. And you should be recognized as what I call a volunteer extraordinaire, a renaissance woman, art advocate, community warrior. And I want to thank you for having a seat at our table. Thank you. Truly peace and, 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 and happiness to you. Thank, thank you. you. And you can learn more about Anne Good Company and all the other great conversations we have had at annegoodcompany.info. And we look forward to next week when you can again enjoy a seat at the table for great conversation and good company. Here we go.